Hello, Curran here. This video is all about marks and channels in data visualization. If you're already familiar with attribute types, categorical, ordered, and quantitative, and you want to know how to choose the most effective way to visualize data, then this video is for you. The topics we're going to cover include marks, such as points, lines, and areas, channels like position, color, and shape, and also how to choose marks and channels based on attribute types that you have in your data and the tasks or questions that you want to be able to perform or answer. Let's start with this data table. Each row here is a car and each column is some property or some attribute of those cars. Typically, rows match up to marks, visual marks, on the screen. And marks could be points, lines, or areas. Typically, the columns map to channels, visual channels. These include position, color, and size. Let's go a little deeper into channels. When I say position, this could actually be X position or Y position. They're independent of one another. And when I say size, what I really mean is the area of that shape. The mathematical term area, like the area of the circle. It's just a more precise definition of size. And within color, in fact, you can break down color into two orthogonal um, dimensions. One is luminance, the variation of brightness, and then the other is hue. And that's the variation of what people typically think of as color, like red, blue, and green, whereas variations of luminance would be like light blue or dark blue. On the top of this grid here, we have categorical, ordered, and quantitative as attribute types. We have dots where it makes sense to use a given channel for a given type of attribute. Notice that X and Y position are the most powerful channels because they can encode all three types of attributes. Area really only makes sense for ordered and quantitative things. You could technically encode categorical data with area, but it would be a little misleading because there's an unnatural ordering between different areas, you know, something is larger than something else. But if the data has no intrinsic ordering, it's sort of misleading to use area. That's why there's not a dot there. And then for color luminance, that can encode ordered or quantitative data because luminance has a natural ordering within itself. I mean, you could say some, some color is lighter than another color. Whereas hue can properly encode categorical attributes because different hues are simply different. No hue is greater or less than any other hue. That's why it maps to categorical attributes really well. So that's a, a summary, a very high-level overview, broad summary of what kind of channels match up with what kind of attributes. And together with marks, you can create visualizations. Visualizations are combinations of marks and channels, meaning any one of these channels could be applied to any one of these mark types. Let's go through some concrete examples. Here's a typical scatter plot that just uses X and Y. So the mark type here is points, and two quantitative attributes are represented, one with X position and one with Y position. These little red dots here mean that this is sort of active in the current visualization. Here's a variation of that scatter plot with stylized circles. I wanted to include this just to point out that, yeah, these circles, even though they're stylized, they could be still considered as points as far as marks go. And it's still just encoding two quantitative attributes, one for X and one for Y. In this scatter plot, another attribute, a categorical attribute, is encoded using hue. In this example, another quantitative attribute is represented using area. You can also use hue and area at the same time. So this scatter plot shows four 
attributes. One quantitative with x, another quantitative with y, another quantitative with area, and a categorical attribute with hue. Here's another example of a scatter plot that uses points with x and y showing quantitative attributes. In this case, the x position is driven by dates, but um, dates in this case, since they're considered as instants in time, can be considered as quantitative attribute. Here's a variation of that scatter plot that connects adjacent points with lines. This visualization uses points and lines as marks. If you take away the circles, what you're left with is a line chart that uses a line as the mark, and it still uses x and y position to encode two quantitative attributes. Here's a variation of that line chart that uses area under the curve. The mark type here is areas, and instead of using y position, I'm saying that, all right, this is actually using area to encode the quantitative attribute temperature. But this is actually misleading because the area doesn't have a zero baseline. This is not really a valid uh, way of visualizing it because see, this is not a zero baseline right here. The domain of the temperature should start at zero. And temperature is not even a, an absolute quantity. So in order to avoid misleading area charts, you should always use a zero baseline. Here's an example of an area chart that makes sense because it has a zero baseline. We can say that yes, this uses the area channel to represent a quantitative attribute because the area under the curve is in fact, you know, it, it corresponds directly to the population value for each of these different points in time. Here's a similar visualization that breaks down the population of the world into the population of the top five most populous countries. In terms of channels, this represents one more attribute, a categorical attribute, namely the country, using hue. Here's another visualization of the same data using lines instead of areas. This pie chart uses areas as the marks and it also uses the area channel to encode a quantitative attribute and uses hue to encode a categorical attribute. In terms of marks and channels, donut charts are pretty much the same as pie charts. Bar charts use lines as the marks. And in this case, we have a vertical bar chart. So X position represents a categorical attribute and area represents a quantitative attribute, the area of these, uh, these lines, these rectangles. Here's a variation of that same visualization that also uses points in addition to lines as the marks. With a horizontal bar chart, the Y position represents the categorical attribute instead of the X position. That's really the only difference between um, horizontal and vertical bar charts. But notice with this bar chart, it's not a zero baseline. So the area of these bars does not actually correspond to the population values. See that value for Mexico? You can't even see it because the domain starts at the, the population value for Mexico, which is really invalid for a bar chart. Bar charts should always have a zero baseline, meaning the domain should start at zero, the domain of the X scale in this case. Here's the corrected version of that bar chart. It uses a zero baseline, so the area, the area as a channel, is now accurately representing the population values for each country. Here's a variation of that visualization that uses points as marks instead of lines. In terms of channels, um, this is a scatter plot but it uses X to encode a quantitative attribute, but it uses Y to encode a categorical attribute. Here's a variation of a scatter plot where both X and Y represent categorical attributes, and area represents a quantitative attribute. With this stacked bar chart, we're using areas as the marks, 
and we're encoding three attributes. One categorical attribute with Y position, up and down. One quantitative attribute with area, the area of each of these slices. And then another categorical attribute with hue. This is a stream graph visualization that uses areas as the marks. The X position is a quantitative attribute, namely time. The area channel, meaning the area of the shape for any given X position, represents a quantitative attribute. And the hue represents a categorical attribute, namely countries. This is showing, by the way, um, the number of refugees and other persons of concern coming from these origin countries. I wanted to include this example because it uses luminance to encode a quantitative attribute. Notice how all these colors, it's the same hue, they're different shades of the same color, only the luminance varies. So the marks here, you could say it's areas, geographic areas. And I combined position of X and Y just into one thing for this because the position here is really driven by geographic position. So we can say that, all right, position is used to encode one categorical attribute, namely these geographic areas. I think these are census tracts. So after seeing those examples, maybe this little grid makes more sense. And you can see how channels together with marks can be used to create visualizations. This taxonomy of channels, though, is kind of a simplified version, just to sort of explain the concepts. I want to present this slide by Tamara Munzner on marks and channels to give a, a sense that there is, in fact, a more detailed taxonomy of channels here. In this taxonomy, as far as channels go, we've got position, horizontal, vertical, and both. Shape, which, you know, it can be used, but it's not really so commonly used. And then size, and size is subdivided into length and area and volume. Color and tilt as another channel. And tilt, again, is one of those things that I don't really see being used that much. Here's another taxonomy of channels from Jacques Bertin, the Semiology of Graphics book. In his view, all right, the, the dimensions of the plane, X and Y, are sort of central. They're the most powerful. And then once you've settled on that, you can uh, modify shape, size. Um, he calls this value, but this is like luminance. Um, there's also texture, which I've only seen in Semiology of Graphics. I haven't seen that in any uh, more modern taxonomies. And then you've got hue and uh, tilt. So this is Jacques Bertin's um, taxonomy of channels. And there have been a number of these uh, taxonomies over the years. Here's another one, the visual variables chart from a visual guide to map design for GIS. Across the top, we've got points, lines, and areas. And going down, we've got shape, size, hue, uh, color value, which is the same as luminance, color intensity, which is the same as saturation, and texture. And there's this other column, what each is best to show. You know, shape is good for qualitative differences. Size is good for quantitative differences. Hue is good for qualitative differences. And by the way, qualitative is used sort of synonymously with uh, categorical attributes. That's what it means. Color value is good for quantitative differences. Color intensity is good for, it says qualitative differences, but I would, I would argue that this has an ordering too, so you could encode quantities with um, the color intensity or the saturation. And texture is sort of an interesting case because they say it's best to show qualitative and quantitative differences. But the thing is, how do we choose how to combine these marks and channels? I mean, there's like a billion possible ways you could do it. I mean, how do we choose between alternative idioms? Idioms from Tamar Munzner's book, it's like a, a chart type or a visualization technique. How do we choose between visualization idioms, combinations of marks and channels?
This is a figure from a 1986 research paper by Jock McKinley, who went on to get involved with Tableau, or the founding of Tableau, I think. It shows these rankings of channels for quantitative, ordinal, and nominal, which is the same as categorical, attribute types. The things at the top are the most uh, powerful, the most effective, and they, they are de decreasing in effectiveness as it goes down the ranking. Notice that position is king. Position is at the top of all of these. For quantitative attributes, the next most uh, powerful channels are length, angle, slope, area, volume, and density. For presenting ordinal attributes, after position we've got density, saturation of color, hue, which I find interesting, texture, um, and so on. And for categorical, hue is the second most powerful after position. And then we've got texture, connection, containment, density, saturation, and, and shape. So this was the state of the art um, ranking and sort of taxonomization of channels as of 1986. Here's a figure from a 2010 paper by Jeff Hare and Mike Bostock. This is about how accurately people perceive the, the quantities behind uh, these different ways of encoding data. And they, they compare it to Cleveland and McGill's paper, which is another seminal paper that did a similar study. And so they studied the effectiveness of bars versus stacked bars versus grouped bars. And this more recent paper extended it into pie charts, or you know, angles, uh, circle packing, and rectangular areas, such as tree maps. This here shows the log error for each. So what it shows is that bar charts are the most accurate way of presenting quantities. The second most accurate is stacked bars. The third most accurate is grouped. and um, it goes to show you also that pie charts are not as readable as bar charts, but also the circle packing technique is even less accurate than pie charts. So this gives an interesting way to sort of prioritize or um, figure out what kind of visual encoding you want if your goal is accurately presenting the data. And here's an interesting piece from the world of um, psychology or psychophysical study. This is Stevens' psychophysical power law. On the y-axis, we have perceived sensation. And on the x-axis, we have the physical intensity. Notice how the perception of length is always exactly correlating with the physical intensity of the length. This may explain why bar charts are the most precise way of representing quantities. Because your perception of length matches with the actual length on the paper. However, with area, the larger the area, the larger your perceived sensation is, but not exactly correlating with the actual area. This is why it may be difficult to compare, uh, for example, adjacent circles in a circle packing. And also brightness is down here. This is um, also called luminance. So this means that encoding a quantity with luminance, it leads to a less readable visualization as compared to encoding a quantity with area as compared to encoding a quantity with length. And up here we've got color saturation. It turns out that the more saturated a color is, you actually perceive it like more than it actually is. This makes it so that if you encode a quantity with saturation, it's also less accurate to read as compared to length. Here's a figure from Jacques Bertin, Semiology of Graphics, again. On the top, there's different types of, um, well, they're not exactly attribute types in Semiology of Graphics. There's association and selection, which I still don't totally understand the difference. The marks being perceived as similar as 
as opposed to being perceived as different and forming families. But in my understanding, these two sort of both represent categorical attributes. And then we've got ordered attributes here and quantitative attributes here. So he says, all right, the planar dimensions, x and y, it can represent all of these very well. Size can be used to represent categorical attributes if your goal is to perceive them as different. Ordered attributes and quantitative attributes. Value or color luminance can be used to represent ordered attributes and also, he says, quantitative attributes if your goal is to perceive them as different. And he's got texture here. He's sort of unique in that he really thinks a lot about texture. Texture could represent categorical attributes as well as ordered. And see how he's representing this order here? It's the density of the texture. That's pretty interesting. Then down here he's got color, but he really refers to hue. Hue can represent categorical attributes really well, but not ordered and not quantitative. Orientation or tilt can represent um, categorical attributes. And then lastly, there's shape, which really just makes sense for representing categorical attributes if your goal is so that the marks will be perceived as similar to one another. So this is Jacques Bertin. I think this originally came out in like 1967, and then they released a 2010 um, English translation of the book. This is sort of a condensed version of that previous figure from, uh, again, Inside Semiology of Graphics. And this is annotated with my like hand-drawn notes in my copy of Semiology of Graphics. And this figure here is actually what inspired my simplified taxonomy of the channels that we started with. But still, how do we decide the best visual encoding? To close, I'd like to go over this slide again by Tamara Munzner from her book Visualization Analysis and Design. These are all the channels laid out in her taxonomy, which I and many others consider to be like the end-all be-all of these taxonomies of channels as of, you know, modern times. And these here are ordered intentionally with regard to their expressiveness. See, on the left, these are all categorized as magnitude channeled, which makes sense for ordered attributes, or, or also quantitative attributes. And on the right, we have the identity channels, which make sense for encoding categorical attributes. And we can decide which of these to use in terms of the expressiveness principle, matching the channel and the data characteristics. This is sort of what I've been talking about all along, matching the attribute types with these channels. But the real way that I think is best in terms of deciding what combination of these to use is the effectiveness principle. Encoding the most important attributes with the highest ranked channels in terms of how accurately they can be perceived. But how do we know what the most important attributes are? I want to point out that this depends on the task at hand. It depends on the task that you want the viewer to be able to perform. It depends on what questions you want to be able to ask of this data through the visualization. This is why you need to have an understanding of your data and the tasks at hand going into a visualization project. All right, that's it for Marks and Channels in Data Visualization. Thanks for watching. Take care.